Welcome to the Fit Strong Women Over 50 podcast, episode number 151. Welcome. I'm Jill. Thank you for joining us. And I'm Chris. Jill and I are your co-hosts for this podcast and the founders of the Becoming Ellie community. In case you're wondering where the name Ellie came from, she was the Norse goddess of aging who beat Thor in a wrestling match. Chris and I thought, we want to be like Ellie. You can find out more about the Becoming Ellie community and this podcast at our website, becomingellie.com. And Ellie is spelled E-L-L-I. Be sure to sign up for our newsletter while you're there. That way you'll know about new episodes and anything else that's new with us. Hey, we have a couple of shout outs to share from our listeners. Menopause is not so scary anymore. Everything you hear in the media makes menopause seem like something dreadful and scary, almost like a disability. I'm so grateful for Chris and Jill and helping me and all women navigate this time of life calmly, with grace, and with the tools and knowledge to live our best life. Wow, that's great. Thank you. Here's another re review we received this year. Nice discovery. Fit Strong Women Over 50 has been a delight since I have discovered and listened to some podcasts. With guests having the spotlight, Chris and Jill's inquiries and feedback result in great conversations with interesting information. This format is pleasant, and I plan to continue to listen and learn from Fit Strong Women Over 50. Thank you. Those are both great reviews. Yes, thank you both for these comments. We really appreciate hearing from you. Today, we're talking with Kathy Murray. She's got a lot to tell us about training as we age and about her passion of competing in triathlons. Let's go to the podcast. <music> Kathy Murray has been in the fitness industry for over 30 years. She has been a competitive triathlete for 20 plus years and continues to evolve in the sport since a total hip replacement six years ago. She is a graduate of The Ohio State University, where she was a member of the 1983 National Cheerleading Championship team. After college, she competed in and won the United States Aerobic Championship in 1986 and spent the year traveling the world as a fitness ambassador. While in Munich, she coached the Munich Cowboys, which is American football, the Amer Munich Cowboys cheerleaders to six national titles in cheerleading and was head trainer and translator for the German gladiators during a pilot TV show for the International Gladiators. Kathy is a strength coach and personal trainer. She coaches a variety of clients in both strength and endurance sports. She lives in Atlanta with her husband, dog, and cat. Welcome, Kathy. It's wonderful to have you with us. It's great to be here. Thanks for having me. Yes, thank you for talking with us. First thing, I see your mantra is fitness starts in your head. Yes. Can you explain that? What does that mean? Yes, my um, clients always tease me because when we start our training, I'm like, I'm like, get your mind right. You know, focus. You know, we have so many distractions uh, in our life. So this is the the time for you. Once you get in your head, hey, I want to start to feel better or, you know, get um, get more fit and nutrition. What have that? It starts in your head. And then your, I would say I say your body will follow. So you have to get your mind right for that. <laughs> yeah, that's so true. If, <laughs> yeah. If you don't have your mind in the game, it just you're just going through the motions. Exactly. You know, I say mind over matter sometimes. Yeah, that, exactly. You've been a competitive triathlete for over 20 years. Yes. And six years ago, I think you've had a hip replacement. Is that yes. right? Um, yes. And I b believe you came back and, and still are competing or competed again. Were you able to actually race competitively afterwards? Yes, I was. Actually, it'll be seven this year that I had that seven. hip replacement. Wow. Seven. Um, yeah, it, I ha was having a lot of pain. And, you know, I've been competitive for a while, so that, that kind of comes with the territory, but it, it got really excruciating where I couldn't walk. Luckily, I have a great 
team, I always say the longer I stay in the sport, the larger my team becomes, who is a soft tissue guy. And he said, you know, I think you're having some impingement. I would go and check it out. You may need a hip replacement. But of course, you're like, you're right. And um, I said, I so I started looking into surgeons and I got the x-rays. And sure enough, they said, oh, you know, you're bone on bone. You hardly have any cartilage left. And then I thought, okay, the biggest thing as an athlete and an active person is how long am I going to be out? How long am I going to be down? What's involved with this? So I just thought recovery, how long is that? And I probably interviewed and I stress this interview surgeons. Everyone isn't for me or for you. Um, I had surgeons that told me, no, you'll never compete. Oh no, you'll never run again. You know, they were just very, very conservative. I knew I was going to be on my feet as a trainer. I knew I wanted to continue the race. And then there were two approaches that they cut to the front, which is the new, um, newer approach where they cut to the top of the thigh. The old approach is they cut to the side, which is going to involve cutting muscle. So once I found out the better of the, um, the surgeries, I just interviewed anterior approaches called surgeons. And then the fourth surgeon was a fitness minded surgeon. He said, of course, you can race again. Um, you, you have to wait. If you like to run, you have to wait four months to let it set. So talking about getting your mind right, I thought the more in shape, the best in shape I am, the faster I'm going to get up. So I continue to swim. I continue to bike and I couldn't run anymore, but I was walking. So I went into the surgery. I did core. I did upper body because you have to transfer yourself. And four weeks post-op, you can get back in the pool and get, I was on a stationary bike. Wow. That's amazing. So it really, you talk about having your mind right. You're on a cane and you're trying to figure out how am I going to be racing again? So the depression you go through is, is real. Nine months later, I did my first triathlon. I just walked the 5k, kind of did a walk run. And then nine months after that, my husband and I had already planned a trip to walk the Grand Canyon. We did, we were going to do a three mile and I did it. So it's just getting back up, getting back into the rehab and, but being strong before the surgery really helped. Doing all the things that you've done, is that cause the hip problem or would you have had that? I mean, I'm always curious about, because you hear people who don't do anything and then they end up needing hip replacement. It wasn't a fall or an accident no, or something. No, it was not. I think when I, because I was saying the same thing, how am I, you know, I was not a big, I was a runner, but I wasn't marathoner or yeah. you know, a big distance person, but I was a big jumper. You know, I was uh-huh. gymnastics, cheerleading, oh, and I yeah. started cheerleading when I was 12. And then I, I was competitive all the way through college. So a lot of, I, I think, you know, some of the, I hear some um, people, some um, guys or women that are basketball players that are jumping, they have to um, sometimes have their hip um, replaced. I'm not, I'm not a hundred percent, but I really had to think through that too. How can I need a hip replacement? No one tells you when you're doing a uh, high impact aerobics in the eighties and <laughs> you're enjoying yourself. No one tells you that the joints will wear out eventually. <laughs> <laughs> So having a goal after your surgery, like to walk the Grand Canyon or to do your first try nine months later, did you know that going into the surgery, you were going to sign up for something like that? Like, how did you get through that period? I I always maintain my swimming. So even if I couldn't kick after the surgery, I had a great, great coach. I would do, they have these things called pool boys where you put them in between your legs and it keeps you buoyant and you just pull. Oh, yeah. So, yeah. So I would like kick, say, 50, 100 yards. If my hip would get tired, then I would put the pool buoy on and and just pull. So that uh, I wanted to keep my stamina up, number one. And then two, I was actually continuing to bike. So once I got to on the stationary, it was hard because even after a year, I remember telling my surgeon, Hey, something's wrong. You know, I'm, I'm having trouble. My leg is going numb. And of course I wasn't 20. <laughs> I was already in my fifties when I had it um, replaced. And he was great. Cause he said, get on the bike more. 
And I thought, okay, this is why I have this guy. He's a sports guy. He gets it. You're not a spring chicken. It's going to take some work to get back. So once I um, start doing the walk run and I could do the 5K, I thought there's no reason why you can't do a race. You just have to take the watch off because you have your times. And that was really hard because yeah. you, you compare pre-hip to post, you know, post-hip, you know, it can be really depressing when you are running a certain speed or swimming yeah. a certain when speed. When you're used to being very fast and all of a sudden right. you're regular or, right. you know, the back of the pack and you're not used right. to that, it can be hard. Yeah. Just, and you're just like, just finish, just finish. That was my, my goal. Yes. Wow. Basically to rehab after your hip replacement, you did swimming and bicycling. And and walking. And then of course I had to have, I went through rehab as well. Oh, right. I went through several weeks of of rehab, a lot of hip exercises and strengthening to, to get, get the hip back. So yes, I I did. I did do that um, as well. Okay. So that would have been with a physical therapist. Yes. With a physical therapist. I think I trained with him six weeks, but I just kind of went above and beyond. If I went twice a week to the um, physical therapist, I was doing a third day on my own. You weren't one of those physical therapy patients that as soon as they finish with you, you sit sit back in your recliner and do anything (laughs) until they show up again. (laughs) Right, exactly. Because I told him I wanted to run and I was just going to keep it at a 5K distance. And then I would come back and get a re-eval to make sure that I was strong enough and loose enough and flexible enough because that that was really um, a challenge as well to start running, running again. And there was no, there was no plans on how do I run after a hip replacement? Cause I hadn't ran in a year. So I just made my own program up. I was on the treadmill and I would jog 30 seconds and then walk 10 minutes. And then, so I kind of just made my own program up. And then I started outside. Cause you know, you're really kind of, you know, a little anxious to fall, trip and fall. So that type of thing. So I just really made sure I was um, was ready to go outside and would keep it short and do it on paths where there wasn't anything that obstacles that would, would make me fall. Sounds like a good plan. I, I know you've said, you know, what we do now or what you do now to stay fit has definitely evolved as you've gotten older. Can you tell us a little bit how that's changed, how you've adapted? I think that... The biggest thing for me, especially being a competitive athlete since I was pretty much my whole life, but definitely in my 40s when I started triathlons, you and I tell my my younger triathletes that I train, you can no longer train like you're 30 when you're 50 because you you need more rest and recovery. You know, if you get injured, it's going to take longer to come back. Speaking of, OK, I have a new I tore my meniscus last year in my knee. So, you know, that type of thing says, OK, as I'm, I'm getting along in age, some things are starting to break down. So what what can I do? Rest and recovery when you're exhausted. Sometimes you have to say, OK, you know what? I can't work out today or I have to cut back. Those things are hard as a, as an athlete because you just want to go, 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 go. But your body is saying, oh, no, we need more rest as we get older. That nutrition, I mean, I'm a, I'm a trainer. I've been a trainer a long time. So I do try to practice what I preach. I do practice what I preach and try to eat right and tell my clients about nutrition. So all the junk. One big thing about getting older and, and athlete, alcohol, my body doesn't tolerate it. I could have a glass of wine, you know, here, there on the weekends. And my body just does not metabolize it like it used to. You know, you kind of lose those liver enzymes that allow you to drink like a fish in your 20s. <laughs> you don't Is have that. Is that it? Is that why? Is that <laughs> yeah. your body? Liver it's enzymes. Liver enzymes, yes. And so you you can't handle the alcohol like you used to when you're 20, you know, in your in 50 plus. Okay. So I've heard plenty of people say I don't drink, I can't handle alcohol as well now that I'm older, but I never knew it was because my, your liver has quit making yes. certain enzymes. Oh. Correct. Yeah, I know. And every time I would drink, even if I had a glass of just wine, I would just feel terrible the next day. I would feel sluggish 
And it would take, you know, two or three days to come out of it. And then, you know, you go on and then you do it again. And then you say, hey, how much is this worth it? Especially if I'm in my tri season now. So I have a race in six weeks. And I tell my triathletes that I train as well, no drinking for 12, 13 weeks. You, you can't do it. And this is why you need the rest of recovery. You don't get into REM sleep. You're not really in your sleep is your recovery. So I tell them, I'm not saying stop drinking forever, but those are the things that interfere with not only an athlete, but as you age, it's just hard to tolerate the alcohol anymore. And for me personally, I can't do it. Oh, interesting. I didn't know that. Yeah. About the enzymes. I knew about that. <laughs> yeah. It kind of sneaks up on you because you're like, well, I used to drink a glass of wine and, and go out and, you know, yeah, run. And right. No. So if I have to do training, um, I think I went to a couple of parties here recently and everyone's like, you're not drinking. And I always say it's a school night. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> I have to get up and work the next day or no, I have to get up and train the next day. So I just do my club soda lime and no one bothers me. <laughs> there you go. That's great. Looking at your photographs on your website, you obviously do strength training because you yes. look fantastic. Thank you. What kind of combination of cardio strength training do you do? Lots of cardio because I am a triathlete. So my weakest event probably would be swim. It's getting better, especially since I don't run as much. Um, I really had to bring my swim up game. So swimming, which I love, love, love that I, I'm a swimmer now because you can swim to your 100. I mean, the buoyancy in the water, it's a full body workout. Um, love that. Uh, and then of course I, I don't, I haven't ran in a while because I, I tore my meniscus last year. So I've been pool running. Oh yeah. Running in like three feet of water, strength training. I just actually did. I, I usually separate my strength training out depending on my season. I'm in my tri season now. So for example, I, I had to get up and do a 5:30 AM swim. So it's a lot of upper body. I mean, you're kicking as well. So I'm like, okay, I have to fit in a lower, a lower body workout and a core workout today. Tomorrow I plan on getting on the bike, which is a lot of lower body. So then I'll do my upper body. So I definitely try to strength train two to three times a week, um, which is always a challenge for my triathletes because they're like, I have to, I still have to bike, run and swim. Strength training is, is so important, not only for athletes because we're, we're in a, a repetitive sport and it can lead to injuries. And I get a lot of triathletes that say, I'm, I'm injured. My physical therapist says my glutes and my quads and my hamstrings aren't firing. Well, they're not doing any, any strength training. So then that's how, why, how I help them develop programs where they're like, wow, I can finally feel my glutes when I'm cycling. And so the, the, the strength training is really, really important. Upper body, the whole body, core and lower body. So I, I strength train, but a lot of my development, especially my upper body, so many people say, oh, well, you must lift a lot of weight. Is it actually from swimming? Because I, I swim three to four times a week. Swimmers always have those wonderful shoulders. Yes. Yes. Uh-huh. So that's exactly when people say, what are you, are you a sprinter? And I always say, I'm, I'm a, I swim. And they're like, oh, okay. That's, that's hard work. Did you swim as a child? Oh, no. I, well, I learned how to swim as okay. a child. Yeah. Luckily, uh, my, my, my mom was like, you're going to go to lessons. So, but I didn't really swim until I got into the sport of triathlons. There's a duathlon, which is run bike. So I was doing a lot of that. And then one of my friends said, hey, let's try this try thing. So I said, okay, well, let me take lessons. And I did the video, you know, because it's all about technique, especially when you're dense like I am. I don't float. So <laughs> it's all about technique. And we had done this together. We're going to do our first try. And a month before the try, she said, I can't do it. Oh. Oh, and I'm like, you talk me into this. <laughs> Are you kidding me? I put all this money into lessons and I just said, okay, I'm going to do it. Number one, because I've committed myself to it. Number two, I, even though I knew how to swim, I had a fear of open water swimming. And I just said, okay, this is going to, you know, if I, my feet couldn't touch the ground, I mean, I could do that in the pool because it was clear. But in a lake, I was really apprehensive about feeling comfortable enough to be able to like, can I save myself? Can I make it through the whole distance? 
And that first race, she was there watching me. <laughs> My friend had talked me into it. I was the last one to come out the water. But when I, cause now they have pool tries, which is great. You can kind of work yourself into it. But right. back when I started in early 2000s, that's, you started in open water. So, so what kind of distances were you going? Uh, 400 to 600, um, yards, meters is the sprint distance. So I just kept that distance. And then the next distance up is double. So you do 1500 yards or like a little less than a mile swim, um, for the Olympic distance. And then you have your half Ironman, which is 1.2 miles and then double that for a full Ironman. So I just really committed myself to getting the technique down, going to the lakes and swimming with groups. And it's just a confidence builder. The more races you do, the better you feel. Uh, Then you become a little bit faster because I was a great runner and biker. So I thought, just make it out of the water. You're good. (laughs) (laughs) And then I would still like, you know, get on the podium, but it was a lot of work on the back end. So I said, Kathy, just, you you have to work. I have a coach. I have a a coach that I, I swim with twice a week that pushes me and it helps me with my technique as well. And of the three, is swimming your favorite now or is it still biking or running? I think now swimming and biking. So now since I've torn my meniscus last year and I'm working my way back, they have categories called the aqua bike. So you do no running. I know they make it easy if you don't. It's swim. kind of like a duathlon, yes. only with a swimming and right. biking. Okay, duathlon, no swimming, triathlon, all three, aqua bike, no running. So you just swim and you bike. Or I'm going to Florida to do a race at the end of April. They don't have an aqua bike category, but. I'm doing a two person relay. So I'm doing the ocean swim, the bike. And then I have a a, a friend of mine doing the 10 K. I get a 10 K runner. So I do a relay. You can do relays as well. So you're going to Florida and that'll be in the ocean. That'll be in the ocean. Talk about open water. Yeah, that was really, uh, after my hip replacement, I wanted to come back and race. And I thought I might as well go all out and yeah. go in the ocean. But the great thing about the ocean is it's you can see, it's clear, and it's buoyant. You The salt water makes anchors like me, <laughs> people that have a lot of muscle, it makes you um, buoyant. It is just a game changer. So nice. I never realized how much having a lot of muscle affects your swimming ability. I have a friend who started swimming and he just would sink right? because he'd always been a lifter and he had a lot of muscle. And I feel like, how can you not float? (laughs) Right. People say, oh my gosh, you're probably such a great swimmer and you're fast. And I'm just like, it's all technique (laughs) because I don't float. But when I go to the ocean... Oh, wow. So when you go to the ocean, I assume you have to go out a bit to get beyond where the waves are breaking. Yes. Or sometimes the first time I did it, it got a little choppy. So there's a coach that we work with um, down in Florida and we usually go there in March and we work with him because it's a different, you know, if it's choppy, your, your, your stroke has to be a little bit different. I have to rotate when I, when I breathe. You know, when you swim in the pool, they say one goggle in. Well, you can't do that in the ocean. I sure get a, a big, you know, mouthful of salt water. So I have to adjust my stroke to turn more where I'm not getting hit with the wave. So it's a different, but it's a great challenge. I love the challenge of uh, open water uh, ocean swimming. And did you learn, teach yourself how to breathe on both sides so that if the waves are coming from your, on your left, you can breathe out of your right or vice versa. My swim coach makes me, that's actually <laughs> today. He was like, okay, swim in your left. I'm a right side breather, but you want to be able to do both in case if somebody's on this side or you have to, but typically when I'm in a race, all that goes out the window and I'm, I'm just more comfortable breathing on my right. I'm not a, I'm not a bilateral breather in a race. It's kind of the muscle memory takes over in a competitive situation. I guess that's why you train so much, right? Right. I remember watching some of the swimmers in the Olympics. I'm like, see, they're swimming. They're breathing only on one side. (laughs) So everyone has a side. But, you know, we learn to do bilateral breathing. But 
you just kind of go with what you know. Some people are more ambidextrous and that probably comes to them more easily. But yes, talk about it being your your mind. I find having the mental ability to switch sides of breathing and that kind of thing is really challenging. It is. Because it's just such a habit. You really have to focus because today he had us saying, okay, we're just going to breathe on the left, one arm drills, and then you're just going to do your freestyle, but you can only breathe on the left and you, it's work. Yeah, that's hard. (laughs) It's work, but it's, you know, if you need to do it, you'll have it. Yeah. Uh, And back to the water thing for a minute. I find swimming in lakes to be, there's something about most lakes have like scuzzy bottoms. Disgusting. <laughs> yeah, it's so creepy. So at least in the ocean, it tends to be sand. sand. And yes, but when you swim in the lake, you're not touching the bottom. I know, but you have to walk in. <laughs> <laughs> Once you get where you can't, you can't. That's stand true. Up, yeah, you're on top. It so doesn't matter. It doesn't matter what's down below. You, okay. you can't see it, so you you just don't give it any energy. <laughs> All right. Good point. <laughs> I would hope that you're on top. <laughs> Not well, on the yeah. yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Let's talk about uh, running for a minute. So you obviously are having difficulties with running right now with the meniscus. and But one of the things we've talked about on the podcast is that as we age, running really does become more difficult for many people, either from injury it just or maybe running as much as you used to is hard on the body. What kind of advice would you give us like that? Should we just quit running? Should we just take up walking? What, what can we do slower? How do we, how do we continue (laughs) to run as we age? To to do a walk run program. There's a, there's a guy, he's an Olympian. He's actually here is from Atlanta, has several running stores. His name is Jeff Galloway and he invented the Galloway method and he does a walk run. So he trains, um, marathoners, everyone, look, the walk is not going to affect your time and it's going to give your body a break. So you can do three minute run, one minute recovery walk, four, one, everyone depend that, you know, gets to what, what that interval is. That's what I did to start back to um, run after my hip replacement. I would just walk and then I would run for 30 seconds initially. And then I would get up to a minute until I focus. But Walk run. I mean, after I rehab this this knee, when I first had the hip replaced, everyone told me to stop running. But I wasn't ready to stop running. I wanted it to be my decision. You know, when I stop running, I'm it's going to be my decision. So at this point in my life, I'm like, okay, you're not going to be a big runner, but I do like running that last mile with my dog. You know, when I walk with, walk with him. So a walk run is probably the red, the best program. Matter of fact. They have a great, um, my clients that like to want to run their first 5K, it's called Couch to 5K. And you you do a walk run and you just increase your run times or you can just continue to walk run. It's a great program. And then that that definitely helps you if you want to do some running as we get older is I would say to, to do a, a walk run program. Now, do you set your phone like a timer or something? Yeah, they have 30? it. You put it on your phone. Um, the, the, well, the couch to 5k is a program. They'll say, okay, now run. And then, you know, you run and then they'll have it's like a, an a app on beep. your phone that just yes. comes on. Oh, okay. Yes. Yes. Now for me or, or some of the uh, advanced watches has an interval program. So you said, okay, I want to run for, you know, uh, two minutes and I want to walk for one. So it'll start like beep, 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 beep. And then it'll say walk. And then you walk. Then it'll give you another cue that, okay, get get ready to run. Your minute's up. So they have a lot of sophisticated walks and and programs on your phone that they'll walk, that'll, you know, help you get through it. I think if you don't have the watch, I think you can. You can do, I mean, I've done it with a stopwatch or time. Yes. Oh, that'll work too. But I think you can download an app that will just do run walk intervals for you. Right. And then, you know, there's, you got to start slow as you get injured. You have to have the right shoes. Um, I have a client, a person that came to me, one of my students, and she was complaining about her feet. Well, she had flat feet. You have to have orthotics <laughs> if you have flat feet. I was like, I don't know how you've been <laughs> doing it. So those kind of things, you have to educate yourself and just go to a store, like a, a specialty store, walk, walking and running. 
and they'll watch your gate. Okay. You turn out, you supinate or you pronate in and they give you the right shoe for walking as well. You still need to do the same thing with walking. What do you say to people who feel that they're too old for working out or something? Do you, you know, as a trainer, as a, an athlete, what do you say to people that feel that they're too old to work out? Uh, I ask them, how fast do you want to be in an assisted living, <laughs> assisted living <laughs> home? <laughs> you have to change your mindset as you get older, because now I have clients in their 80s. I have clients, I start in their 70s. And I have a, a, a great client that she started in her 70s and she's 82. And her biggest thing when we started strength training, she said, I can carry my own groceries into from the car to the house. I don't have to ask my husband to do it. And I can lift the bags up and put them on the counter. Huge. That was huge for her. And, but she had no upper body strength. So her husband was taking her her bags in and and she was like, I can get up. She recently was walking her dog and and fell. Um, So we were, she had to go to rehab. Uh, She broke, she had broke her arm. And, um, she told me, she said, the PT, the first thing he told me to do is sit in a chair. He had arms on it in the stand up. And she stood right up. And the, the, the PT looked at her like, oh my, because he thought she was going to, at her age, was going to push off the, the armrest. And she said, my trainer would kill me if I used the armrest. <laughs> but squats, squats are sitting down and standing up. Functional things that we need to do to get to be active to we're older. That's why you want to do strength training as you get old. So you can be as independent for as long as possible. That's what I tell them, whether it's getting out of a chair, whether it's playing with your grandkids, those things require strength and flexibility. And so that's why I say it's, you're never too old to start. Lifting the 40 pound bag of dog food at the grocery store. <laughs> right. <laughs> My mother was like, I got this. We were, went to Ohio and um, had wood piles. And she's like, I got this. And I'm like, she's 92. And I said, are you sure? Wow. She's like, it's not that heavy. But she. <laughs> at 92, trains. she's moving wood. She's moving wood. She's doing silver sneakers. She's walking three to four miles with her neighborhood ladies. She's enjoying life at 92. That's excellent. She's not sitting in a chair. So it's never too old. I start people all the time late and they are so excited just to, or newfound things, p- taking things out the cabinet, bending down, stooping down, picking things up, just regular functional things, going for a walk with their, with their, their kids or grandkids. That's, that's worth it. When someone comes to you, what kind of advice do you give? To them, to women who want to be fit and strong, let's say, and they're over 50. The first is what what, what, what their goals are. You know, I, I we have a full assessment that I take them through, flexibility, strength, balance. And then from there, we, we go. But their goal could be, I have a guy, uh, I've been training for a while. Well, a guy, a guy and a woman, but she wanted to, her granddaughter was doing, they were doing some type of rites of passage. She was turning 13 and they were going to go hiking in Ireland with her and her daughter and the granddaughter. I said, okay, you cannot be the weakest link. They cannot be waiting on you. (laughs) Right. We have to get this, you know, we have to be strong. So time to train, right? Yes. Time to train. So, and I just sent out an email with a video about how strength training helps 50 plus with the menopausal, prepare menopausal and postmenopausal, the shifts in your weight and how strength training. So it depends on what their goals are. Most people just want to get fit or I work with a lot of physicians that say you have to start exercising. Osteoporosis is huge. A lot of women come to me that have osteopenia when they're on that borderline of osteoporosis and they're Medication is only going to help so much. So strength training is going to help them with bone density as well. You said that, uh, you know, that you want to practice what you preach and staying fit with, by maintaining optimal health, including nutrition. And uh, you mentioned that just a little bit. Can you tell us a little bit more about, you know, what you tell your clients to try to do as far as keeping good nutrition? 
I try to educate them regarding staying hydrated, help them with try to do moderation. You, you won't, none of my clients will, they won't, they won't see me say, don't have that. Let's just limit it. You can't fry every day. You know, let's like, I always say, do Friday is a Friday. <laughs> you can have fried food on Friday or, you know, you know, what have you, if they have, um, some of them have young kids. So the nutrition is huge. And what I'm, I'm finding as I'm getting older is the food sensitivities. I can no longer have dairy, but there are thousands of plant-based, you know, oat milk, (laughs) almond milk. There's everything. So that was, I had a food allergy test and it said casein was the top. And I'm like, casein, it's cow's milk. That was the number one thing, that soy, there were certain things. And I thought, okay, now I can look at some of the sheep cheeses and those type of things. Um, so food sensitivity to gluten, that's been another sensitivity. That I, I There's so many people walking around with, with food sensitivities and they're feeling terrible and they don't even know it. You know, that's another thing. So I'll encourage them, you know, get a food allergy test. And a lot of them is gluten or I have a, a client that was having a lot of sinus issues and she was getting ready to have a third sinus surgery. And I'm like, you really need to look at your nutrition as far as dairy. And sure enough, she couldn't have, it was the mucus, all that dairy was, and who wants to have that a third surgery? And so, so she went to the ENT and I encouraged her to go to a, more of a holistic, homeopathic, functional medicine doctor. And she said, dairy is your problem right there. You know, so she did a lot of the nasal rinses now and she didn't, that was several years ago. She didn't have to have surgery. So those types of things that you don't even think about that it's, it's what I'm eating. Um, a lot of the processed foods, I mean, I'm always sending out information on these ultra processed foods and the cancers and, you know, especially now with younger, the younger generation is, it's, it's really disturbing what the nutrition. So yes, I, I've had to cut, like I said, the alcohol, I've had to cut gluten, I've had to cut dairy. So I can speak on, yeah, that croissant, oof. It, it killed me, you know, baked goods was, was a, was a big thing, but when I couldn't have the gluten and it was making me feel bad, you know, your weight automatically just, it's, you're healthier, you feel better, you have more energy. So that's the type of things that we talk, talk about. Are they eating enough? What's the quality of food that they're eating? Are they drinking enough? Cause that dehydration is a form of disorientation. And I can tell my older clients, sometimes they're just like, huh? And I said, wait, how much water have you had? <laughs> Did you drink your water? <laughs> and they're like, oh, I only had like one bottle yesterday. And I'm like, oh no. So just educating them. Okay. Here's a, put your water bottle out, constantly feel it, you fill it up, you know, have it there where you can see it. That those types of things is just give them start off with an eight ounce glass. How much do you recommend that they drink each day when they're working out? Everyone is different. I usually try to give them that eight eight ounces. Start their day off with the with water. I'm a coffee drinker. I have like my coffee in the morning, so I try to do a glass of water with with a cup of coffee. I always tell them the pee test. <laughs> that's just that's easy. Looking at your urine, if it's dark you're not drinking enough, you know, or or a lot of times when you're thirsty, you're already dehydrated. Or a lot of times you're thirsty, but you think you're hungry, but you're not. You drink a glass of water first. And then that urge of uh, of wanting to eat something may go away. What about electrolytes? Do you think that people should, if if you're drinking a lot of water, should you also occasionally throw in like something with electrolytes in there? Yes, I, I'm a big well because I'm a triathlete as well. I um, I do electro, electrolyte sports drinks. I um, have a company that I work with that is a little bit cleaner than the when I say cleaner, the Gatorades and and stuff like that. I know they're they're very popular here, but ooh, if you really dig down and see what's in them, you know it it can a be a lot of sugar. Yeah, and food dye. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, food dye and stuff like that. Or, you know, sometimes I tell them, you know, you can just do 
uh, juice, water, and um, salt. Sometimes I'll do for my drink that if I'm, you know, running or, but yeah, you can do those. They have some uh, electrolyte waters now that you can um, also drink. Do you recommend any particular way of eating either for yourself or to your clients? I mean, you've talked about giving up dairy and gluten if you are sensitive to it, but do you suggest people eat, you know, vegan or paleo or anything I leave that to them. If they're true. I have, I do have some clients that say, Hey, I want to try plant based, you know, only. And I had thought about that for a while, but for me, I need a little bit. If you're going to do vegan or if you're going to do plant based, you really have to know what you're doing. And, and I'm not a registered dietitian. So I have people that I can say, Hey, go to this person. She just, she's a physician and she just deals with plant-based nutrition for her, her, her patients. So I let someone else, I let them get educated. And if that's the, the same way, you know, I, I've had to stop, you know, I really don't do a lot of meat, you know, chicken, fish. I, I love the pescatarian diet because I love seafood. I love fish and I, I never get sick of different types of fish. Make sure they're not eating late, you know, trying to eat, you know, no later than seven uh, because they're, you know, you're the, you're the busiest in the day. So you kind of want to, you know, have a, a great, a good breakfast. You may have a snack and I give them ideas of, you know, some things to snack on, you know, apples and peanut butter or something that's going to fill them up for the snack. And then, you know, lunch and then maybe another snack and then a dinner. And if they're at work, I try to tell them to, to food prep. So instead of getting in your house and going, oh, shoot, what's they're going to, I'm going to either just take this out of the freezer and microwave it. I have them, you know, cook a pack of chicken or cook a pack of salmon and then put it in baggies. And then you can just throw it in the microwave or, you know, it's just a heat and eat, throw it in a salad, throw some vegetables with it. Don't make a bowl, throw some rice and things like that. I have, have those for the salad. So trying to just get them to get the proper um, nutrition and not, eat so much chips and, and junk and, and donuts and, and that type of thing. I do have people that talk about the intermittent fasting. That's just something I, I have get low blood sugar. So I have to eat, you know, four or five times a day. So for me, that, that wouldn't work that 12 hour, you know, depends on what they do. But what I find, and I just also sent this out, a lot of people with the intermittent fasting, they don't fast, but when they break that, when they break the fast, they eat whatever they want to eat. <laughs> I just had this conversation with a, with the client. And it's like, you can't, that's not the purpose. You still have to eat healthy if you intermittent fast, but I send out things to them and try to educate them. If that's what they want to try, it's not going to, it's not going to hurt you to try it. Everyone has to kind of find it, find what's going to work for them. Well, and if you, as someone has pointed out is that if you quit eating at seven o'clock in the evening and you don't eat breakfast until seven the next morning, there's a 12 hour fast right, right there. There you go. Right. I had a, a, a new client and she's like, I'm never hungry for breakfast. And then my first question was, how late do you eat? Well, she was eating at like nine to 10 o'clock. There you are. You're not going to be hungry if you eat that late. So I really had to get her to change to eat, start off with breakfast. And then you're not, your first meal is at 2 p.m. Then you're starving and then you're two, three, and then you're, you load all your calories later in the uh, day and evening. And then you're less active. You're sitting on the couch. Right. That's an easy habit to get into too, I have to say. Sitting on the couch and yeah, snacking and eating later in the day. Yeah. And mindless eating where you're just eating, whether it's a sports event or a binge watching a movie, it's dangerous. Yeah. <laughs> you put your hand in and then the whole bag is gone. Yeah. Like, that that's happen? true. It's always a rude With awakening. <laughs> gremlins have come in here and <laughs> Who ate taking all this? my chips. <laughs> right. So just look, if you're going to have chips, put them in a bowl a small bowl and that's it. Just eat that, you know, those types of little tricks that I try to get them instead of eating, don't eat out the bag. Yeah. It's just things that I don't think people think about or, or before you go up to go get a second helping, wait, wait 30 minutes. And if you still want the second helping, do that. We counseled one of my clients that was a fast eater. 
So I made her slow down, put your fork down between every bite instead of <laughs> just shoveling it in. Yes. And then you're so you're eating so fast and you're trying to go back for a second helping. Yes. So those types of things I would make her, she was sick of me, but she, she, she did it. She, I made her take screenshots of her food <laughs> and then I have people weigh their food, you know, Hey, four ounces of a protein. Okay. It's salmon, but it's dense. It could be six or seven ounces. You don't need that much. So food scales and just trying to get people to think buffets. Oh my gosh. It's a nightmare for a per- personal trainer. Yeah. Go around the buffet and see what you want. Cause you start at the beginning, you do the salads and to have the stuff you don't even want at the beginning. And then you're like, Oh wow. Shrimp. That's my favorite. And you have stuff on your plate that you're not even going to eat. Right. <laughs> Like, why did so I put I, this lettuce on right? here? Right. It's like, I'm not going to, well, it's on my plate. I guess I got to take a couple bites. But those types of things, walk around, buffet. Okay, yeah. Shrimp. Oh, wow. They have my favorite salad. They have this. So that way, you know, you can hold your plate until you get to your favorites versus just putting stuff on your plate as you go around the buffet. Yeah. Yeah. Buffets are a challenge. Yeah. Yes. <laughs> Well, my next question, you have to think back a ways. Uh You attended the Ohio State University and I, and you were a member of the 1983 National Cheerleading Championship team. So that's a really big deal. And, and, you know, Jill and I are both Ohioans and I'm curious, um, what, cheerleading at a big 10 school was like and for our listeners who you know don't know the big 10 is an athletic conference for large universities that are really into football and other sports and so you can tell us a little bit about what that was like oh wow that was talk about changing my life um i obviously i was born and raised in in columbus ohio so i watched the cheerleaders all the time at the games my mother was a nurse at the university hospital there on campus. And I was a cheerleader in high school, but I was the one holding the other girls. I was all girl, all girls squad holding the girls. And I got to Ohio state and I was like, Oh my gosh, you, what have you gotten yourself into? Now you have guys pitching you, throwing you around or standing on shoulders when you're used to being on the ground. So, but it was my dream to be, a cheerleader there. So I, I entered, they have clinics where they t- taught you the dance and, and, you know, all the skills. And it was two days and it was like 200 girls for seven spots. Oh my At that time they had seven girls and seven guys. They only had 14. They have more now. And the girls that were already on the team were coming back. They were, they were trying out. So you thought, okay, well, there's seven girls, four of them are graduating. That's three spots. You know, that's kind of how you summed it up because they had the experience. And I remember I went through the whole t- two days and I got all the way down to the finals. And I thought, oh my gosh, this is, this is huge because it was, that was probably the first time that I, when I, since I started trying out that I didn't make it. I made it all the way down. And I thought, I'm good. <laughs> Even my first time out, I make it, you know, to shorten. And it was because I did not have the gymnastic skills. Because at the time, they used to just, the girls would dance and the guys would tumble. Well, at Ohio State, the girls had to tumble as well. So the judges were like, you were great. We love everything. You have to just get together, you know, get the gymnastics. And I just spent a year in the gymnastics gym and and then, you know, I made the squad after that. But just being down as is if people don't know, the stadium now holds like a hundred thousand. So being being down on the field with a hundred thousand people, I mean, you talk about adrenaline rush and just so fun and you know, basketball arena as well. But um going to the nationals First time in Hawaii, cheerleading not only taught me life skills of being in front of people and and teamwork and dedication and that type of thing, but the level of competitive cheerleading was huge. Went to Hawaii, which was huge from Ohio girl. I've never been to Hawaii. And that's where the championships were. They were, they're actually on their own show now, but they were um, at the Hula Bowl live. 
it, that we competed. I still just remember that like it was yesterday on, and, and Magnum PI was being filmed. <laughs> Oh, yeah. <laughs> we got to meet Tom Selleck. Make a, oh, man. Tom Selleck. oh my gosh, it was just like a little a girl from Ohio's dream to travel and then go to Hawaii and then win the national championship, you know. And we finally, I think it was years ago, we got the national championship rings. Oh, and yes, it was huge because you know, back then in the eighties, they were like, oh, okay, well, you know, you're a cheerleader, nice. but now they have scholarships. For cheerleaders now, just like, a, you know, a regular lettered athlete for, with any other sport. So, yes, it was it was quite something. That it was we a big deal. National. That's big cool. Big deal. Big deal. Wow. Yeah, I can imagine being in that stadium. Oh, it was it was just. And then they have an alumni game every first game. So all the drum majors, cheerleaders and see the drum majors, cheerleaders come back on the band. We, so I was going to say, you come back. The experience of trying out for cheerleading is very similar to the experience of, not that I did, but I have relatives who did, who for trying out for the marching band right. at Ohio State. Yeah, very competitive. Very competitive. And you have these kids that are coming from all their band, high school bands and right. really working hard and and trying to make it. And it's and And they'll tell you often, if you don't make it the first year, you have to, you know, go do you have this to training. Yeah, you have I didn't to make practice it my first year, in, yeah, and then try to... again. Right, exactly. Yeah. I had I had played instruments going in from from high school to college, but Ohio State had a brass band, yeah. and I played, you know, clarinet. <laughs> <I> played clarinet, <laughs> bassoon. So. Well, you couldn't have been both a cheerleader <laughs> and in the band. <laughs> not there, no, absolutely not. I was I was cheerleader in high school, but I played in the orchestra. Uh, in, in high school, but um, yeah, it's it's just, it's the level of uh, competitive cheerleading, which was great because when I went to Germany to, to coach German cheerleaders. Yeah. Tell told us me that, about that. Yeah. That was going to be my next question. Tell us about that. After I stopped cheerleading, the aerobics craze was really big in the eighties. So I started um, going to aerobics classes and, and realized I was in such, I wasn't in the shape that I needed to be in. Cause you know, Cheerleading is anaerobic. You're doing a routine for a minute and then boom, you're stopping. And then you're jumping and stopping. But aerobics, I was like, oh my gosh, what is this? I can't even last, you know, half an hour. So they had a training program called Buckeye Aerobics. And I started teaching there, which led to the United States Aerobic Championship. Two other friends of mine, we competed and won that, traveled all around the world for General Foods with Crystal Light. We were sponsored by Crystal Light went to Tokyo. And then I was in, I actually, after college, I went into, after I did the championship, I went into medical sales. You, know, you got to do that. You got to follow that degree. <laughs> well, and, you got to have uh, a job. <laughs> yes. And the corporate life just wasn't uh, my cup of tea, let's say. And uh, I was in medical sales and I just, you know, I always stayed involved with fitness because I was still teaching in gyms and things like that. But I got a contract to go over to Europe to, to be a fitness education educator. And my parents thought I was crazy because I had a Fortune 500 <laughs> job. I said, I hate it. I'm going to, to Europe. I'm going to Germany to work. <laughs> They're like, are you crazy? You have a great job. Yeah, a great job for somebody else. <laughs> yeah. They did. My dad was, yeah, he was like, you're not supposed to like your job, you know, but um, <laughs> I went anyway. And I said, look, what's the worst that could happen? I have a job, you know, I'm working. So I went to Germany, no German, you know, had to learn everything that was before Google Translate. So you just had a little dictionary. And one of the, I came out of my class one day and the manager was there of the German, of the Munich Cowboys cheerleaders. And she said, we have a team here. She could speak any English. So I, they, and I was just there. So my, I wasn't fluent yet. And she said, we have a team here and we have an American football team and they're called the Munich Cowboys. Would you come to practice and see if you would like to coach them? Went there and, you know, it's an American sport. <laughs> So they were doing the best they could. I was like, oh, my gosh. <laughs> so I started coaching them for their uh, games, which were in the summer. But then they told me, hey, we have this these championships. And they, you know, that was VCR land, you know, to show me a video. 
And it was just really rough because they did not have a clue. So I basically had to, and that's where my um, experience going from an all girl to being, you know, on top and showing them how to stunt and, you know, tumble, do gymnastics. And so we started, um, I started just building a team. It was a little rough. I mean, because they were language barrier, learning all that that. language. And I just told them, look, because they they have English. They have to speak English in school. They have to go through. They would some of them didn't know. Some of them would translate. And and I would tell them, okay, I have to get this. And so you can't speak English. I have to just struggle. And that's how I really learned. I was with them two, three times a week. And the more my ear became trained, they could speak German to me. And I'm like, okay. And I could speak English and I can start to translate. So my German came up really quickly, but just getting the confidence of the girls, Hey, this is a team. I would make these mantras. There's no I in team. You're only as strong as your weakest link. And we would have these mantras that I would take into the championship, trying to teach them If you fall, you have to keep going. You know, who's the cleanest? What's the difficulty level? So it was it was a great experience, which I just wrote a book about it because Germans weren't happy. They had an American coach and they had a black American coach. This is 2000. So it was it was uh, challenging to keep the girls focused on what we're here for, what we're doing. You must have really stood out as a foreigner in Germany. Yes. And, and the language, even though you're speaking it, they can hear the, the American accent. So well, sure. Yeah. Every, I, that's when you learn, you know, as a country, you're like, everyone loves America. No, they don't. You know, <laughs> even if you're not, even if you're not black, you know, I had white Canadian friends and they were like, Oh my gosh, I, I couldn't even get service because they knew I was an American, you know, just that you were a foreigner. Yeah. It was really such a wide, I'm so happy I did it. I mean, I was in my early thirties when I went there and I lived there for five years. I was able to travel to different countries, different experience, different religions. And I started my personal training business there. And so I had Israel, France. I mean, I had like the United Nations of clients. (laughs) That's that's exciting. So that's how Bit Body started really. So cheerleading as a sport, that's basically how you were training folks, right? It's like, can you talk to us a little bit about training as a sport? Do you, do you recommend it to younger women? The cheerleading? Yes, cheerleading. Yes, it's, it's really, really competitive now. They start at five. They start with peewees now. Well, first of all, I'm very proud to say competitive cheerleading became an Olympic sport. In 2021. Yes. Yeah, so I, IOC has recognized cheerleading as an Olympic sport. So they have a cheer union in world competitions now. So they have 71 countries competing. But yes, now they can start younger. They learn the skills younger, gymnastics and things like that. I would just say, because a lot of people are just in the competitive cheerleading and they don't cheer for their schools quite as much. I mean, they have, they, sometimes they do both, but the competitive cheer, the cheer gyms are, it's just huge. It's huge now, but yeah, I would definitely um, recommend it because it can get you into college now. (laughs) It couldn't get you into college uh, before you can get a scholarship with cheerleading. And like I said, it just, if you're shy, if you, I'm never was shy, but it it really does get you in front of people and, and give you those skills that you may not have from an, an, another sport. And, you know, obviously it's a team, team event. So you have that team uh, cohesiveness too, but, but you do have to do more. I didn't do strength training when I was a cheerleader. I mean, when I was in college, I was strength training. So I did it, but now they, they have to start younger with push-ups, And even if they're young or pushups, some, cause you have to be able to pitch the girls now hold the girls now. So it's, it's totally different now. It's, it's, it definitely has evolved into a sport, which I love because we, we worked hard. You know, we did football, especially if you were two sports, it was a year round thing and right. keep your grades up. 
Right. So it was, oh, yeah, it, grades. <laughs> yeah, the grades are what you're in college for, yeah, or high school for. So, yes, yeah, so definitely a different time where they have to definitely do some type of strength training with competitive uh, cheerleading now yeah. than when I was in school. So someone could be doing competitive cheerleading and not actually cheerleading at their school. They're not doing cheers at the different sports or. Right, right. Sometimes they'll just be part of a competitive cheer gym and then they'll have separate, you know, school cheerleaders or sometimes they're they're doing both, which is which is a lot. But and then a lot of times I'm finding that when I was a cheerleader, I cheered for two sports and sometimes they'll just say, OK, here are the basket. They'll just cheer for one sport. So you did mention that you co-authored a, a book. Now, it's an audio book? Yes, it's an audio book now, but I'm, it's actually going to be um, formatted for a paperback and ebook. I'm excited. Oh, okay. Months. It's called The Munich Cowboys Cheerleaders. And basically it is, I have a wonderful uh, client who is a New York bestseller, uh, Martha, Martha Hall Kelly, and she does historical fiction. She does Lilac Girls was her first big novel. and Lilac uh, Girls? Lilac Girls. Oh, I've heard so of that. She, I yes. mean, that's, yeah, okay. Yes, yeah, so um, she does historical fiction. And when she was first getting her book deal, she had always heard about my time in Germany. And in 2021 or 2020, 2021, she said, hey, Audible is coming wants me to write a uh, audible original. And I thought, great. You know, it was always her biggest cheerleader. And she said, I think your story of going over, leaving your job and going to, to, to Munich is just fascinating. I think we should, I'm going to pitch that to my book agent. She pitched it to a book agent and um, I became an author. <laughs> that is not exciting. It was so exciting, but so awesome. I was able to re- reunite with the girls because like I said they were 15, 16, 17. You know, I was in my thirties and then, you know, 20 something years later, you know, they're forties moms, you know, professionals, but it was really great to go back and go through a lot of that, those things I kind of pushed down, you know, or pushed out on. Um, what I went to to get there, the language, the um, isolation where you don't speak a language, the different cultures, the different things with the culture, you know, be, being discriminated against. I couldn't my, my my roommate in college was half German and she was a, a, a journalist there. So we would go to get an apartment and they you would call and they would say, yes, it's free. It's available. Then when I show up, they go, oh, no, it's not free anymore. So dealing with really, really blatant racism that type of thing, but still embracing the girls and embracing the sport that I love with cheerleading and, and taking them to to championship. That was a culmination of me being there, leaving corporate and just trying to inspire others. Go for your dreams. You know, don't lo- let anybody tell you don't, because if that happened to me, I wouldn't have the Munich Cowboys cheerleaders. I wouldn't have championship. I wouldn't have exposure to the whole world at a young age where I traveled to different countries. So I'm glad that I, I did it. And is the book right now? So right now it's in audio form. Yes, is it's that- audible original. It's a, uh, it's on audible right as uh, right now. So I will let you know. So I think the I'm going to re-release the ebook and paperback probably here in May. Yeah, but it's great. We have a great narrators and, it just talks about my whole story on meeting the girls and the language and wonderful, just excitement. Yeah, that's great. Be- besides all of those things that you've done, you also work as a per- personal trainer. And is that online or in person or both? You know, how how do you do that? Is it? Well, it's it's uh, COVID has changed a lot of things. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, we'll just keep talking about that. <laughs> you know, you notice as you get there, you go, oh, that was before COVID. Okay, yeah, no, that was 19, 20, 2019 because COVID had now, you know, how you kind of. Yeah, yep. There, It's that defining moment. Put things in perspective on post-COVID, yeah, with the lockdown, you know, everything. So I had friends that were still in, in Europe, in Italy and Germany. And I remember, and we all remember, you know, Italy, they couldn't come out of their houses. Oh, and, right. And the, and the Germans, they all, everybody had to wear like N95 mask. And they were telling me this. And I thought, this is coming. 
You know, even though we're like, oh, that's over there. It's not here. And I told my clients before Atlanta shut down, I said, we have to go online because this is coming. Everything's going to shut down. I just could feel it. And I was actually had clients that were in other states that couldn't find a trainer that I was already doing online training. So you were ahead of the curve. Yes. And I had clients that were like, okay, I'm at a my second home. But I, I, so I'm going to put equipment over here and so, oh, you're going to your second home. We'll train from there. So I was kind of doing the, the online training anyway before that. And then when we, I remember the week that we shut down, I said, okay, so this is what we're going to do. We're going to order these bands. You know, you don't need much stuff in the house. And this is what we're going to do. You're going to put this in the door and it's going to anchor. I showed some like my 80 year old, this is how we FaceTime. So we're going to FaceTime now, <laughs> you know, we're showing them what to push and everything just shut down. Everyone was okay. Why is this working out via video harder than I expected it to be? So my clients got their houses set up, whether room or, you know, that type of thing. And was like, well, now I don't have to fight traffic. I don't have to pay a gym membership. And so 2020 came. I was no what, and I trained everybody online. 2020, 2021 came, and everyone was like, and that's kind of when the vaccine started. And everybody was like, oh, well, I don't want to go back in yet. And and then everybody was so comfortable with, I can just walk down the hall, or I can just walk down the basement. I, you know, boosted my Wi-Fi that they don't didn't want to come off. So now my business is 100% online. That's cool. Wow. It really transformed everything, didn't it? Yes, it really did. But people were, it was convenient. They still got a great workout. I do have clients that have like condo gyms and they just take me with them. So what, what kind of clients do you work with? Is it, you know, women over 50 primarily or a- most of my clients, I think my youngest now is in her 40 still. Good now, but I would I've been training her since she was 28. I started training her before for her wedding. This was before the husband, before the two kids. So um 40, my oldest is 85. So I have athletes, I have stay-at-home moms, I work with physicians, so they they refer their clients, hey, they need to, they have osteoporosis, they need to come to you. Um, my 82 year old that I had that I was bragging about shh, to her, my client who's a physician said, you have to start working out those types of things. So anywhere from I need to get stronger, I want to climb Mount Kilimanjaro. <laughs> I need somebody to train me. I'm a triathlete. I just want to be able to hang with my grandkids. So I have the gamut you know, from 40 to 80 and everybody is different, you know, on what their goals are. Like I said, I'm, I'm be, because I'm older now, I'm really my 50 up. I'm really try to focus on not only strength training, but fun, you know, functional balance is huge balance and, and things like that. My, my, uh, one of my clients broke her foot. And she said, thank you for making me do one legged squats. Cause now I can get up off the toilet. <laughs> <laughs> with one leg because you make me do single leg arms and legs. So th- different things like that. And I told him, I did not know that until I had my hip replaced that I was so happy that I was doing single leg exercises because I was kind of hobbling around on, on, on one leg for a while. So just every, it's no longer like, I want to, you know, get a six pack or the People are just, they want to feel better and live longer and be, and be active. What's the name of your business, your company? It's called Fit Bodies. Fit Bodies. Fit Bodies, B-O-D-I-E-S. Yes. So I started in Germany. I was, I, I, they had a English speaking magazine and I said, personal trainer from America and I would go to people's homes. So that's how I started it. And I was in Germany and then was in the gyms and people's home and then. I knew I wasn't going to go back to corporate when I moved back to the States and I started my fit, fit, uh, fit bodies here. And what's next for you? Any races or competitions or what's on your agenda? Well, I do the race in, in uh, Florida. So that's always my first race. You know, again, I've been doing this 20 years, so I'm happy just doing one, two races a year. Keeps me in shape, keeps me training for a goal. So I have uh, six weeks in St. Pete, 
Florida. It's called St. Anthony's. And I'm doing a relay because I'm not running. And then I usually do one. They have one in Louisville called Try Louisville. And I they have an aqua bike category. So that's what I'm focusing on that. I'm reformatting the book and up to the creator. I'm looking at trying to make the book a production. Oh, wow. That's great. I could see that being a Disney movie. <laughs> they love those. <laughs> it's a, it's an inspirational sports. It's true. Yeah. 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 The, uh, uh, it's an Olympic sport. If it, my story. Yeah. Oh, I love a, it. Yeah. I love is, it. I could see there that. to boost, to take the competitive level in Europe that it is today. Call me <laughs> for a TV series or a movie. So uh, good luck with that. That's yeah. awesome. So yes, lots of fun things that uh, that are in the loop. So if our listeners want to follow along and follow you online, where should they go? My uh, website is fit hyphen bodies b as in boy o d i e s dot net. All my social media is there. Uh, I have two actually Instagrams. It's try baby one, but you just click on it. It'll come to that. And I started actually a cheer with Kathy because that's my way of motivating people every week through song, through music. And I give inspirational quotes. Fun. That's great. For example, you know, a dead end is an opportunity to turn around, you know, just trying to motivate people. Through music. Yes, all that is on my on my website, my videos. You'll see the cheerleading championship from Ohio State. You'll see my crystal light aerobic uh, championship there. So I had to really dig deep <laughs> <That's great. laughs> and reformat stuff from VHS uh, <laughs> to put it in. Well, we'll definitely put links to that in our show notes, too, so that our listeners can find that. That's wonderful. Thank you. Thank you so much for talking with us today. It's just been Really a great experience. You're very inspirational. Oh, thank you. Thank you. Yeah, thank we you. really learned a lot too. I really <laughs> appreciate it. Well, so I always much. tell my clients thank if it you. was it was easy, we wouldn't be here because it is. <laughs> right. it's, it's, it's 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 definitely a a marathon, not a sprint. But it's it's worth it to get healthy and that's great. And I do the best I can to, to motivate and inspire people. All right, great. Thank you so much. Thank you for having me. Yeah. All right. We'll talk again soon. Bye bye. 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 Every time I start to get lazy about exercise, we talk with someone who makes me feel like I really should be doing more. It makes me want to do more. Yeah, it's really fun talking with her. You know, although she's a personal trainer, that's just one aspect of her fitness life. It was just so interesting to me to listen to all the places that she's been around the world doing fitness things. It's just, it's very exciting and inspirational too. Yeah. Yeah. This is just a little aside, but I know that many people say that alcohol bothers them more as they get older, but I did not realize it's because your liver quits making the enzymes that it used to. So I don't know why, but that just really surprised me. Yeah. It didn't really surprise me so much in that I feel like every part of my body has changed over the years and, you know, my eyes, you know, everything. So it's not surprising to me that the liver. I know. I just never thought about enzymes. (laughs) I guess that's it. Different foods. And sometimes people get allergies later in life. I know that happened to me. Yeah. You know, your body changes and it's that's true. You know, as they say, menopause, there's a lot of different things. I find that uh, seeing what Kathy's been able to do to modify things, like with her swimming, you know, she used to do so much with cheerleading and, you know, some of those much more challenging, like doing those jumps and the tumbles and, you know, all that gymnastics high on people's shoulders. Yeah. Yeah, The gymnastics stuff. And then, you know, now she is uh, really such a strong swimmer. It's really interesting. There's always a way to find something that can keep you challenged, you know? Well, yeah. And going back from having a hip replacement to doing triathlons is pretty impressive. Yeah. Yeah. What did she say? Nine months before her first race? Wow. Yeah. Something. Yeah. So it's a lot. The biking, swimming. And and I really liked her advice about the run-walk. Yeah. Oh, for, absolutely. For doing the running. Galloway method, I think, yeah. is what she yeah, talked Jeff, about. Jeff Galloway, yeah. Yep. And if you don't have that 
app or one of the apps on your phone, one way I've heard of people doing it is looking at the telephone poles. I mean, I'm out in the country when I run, but how often the telephone pole, you know, run to the next pole, walk the pole. I know that's something that people do as well. I used to run my block, my old house and the running around the block, I forget, it was maybe half a mile or something like that, third of a mile. So I would run one loop and then I would walk a loop and then I would run a loop and walk a loop. It was a nice, it didn't have to even think about it. It was, yeah. you know, except am I at the mailbox yet? <laughs> <laughs> intervals kind of. Yeah, yeah. that's yeah. it. I was intervals. Yes. Yep. Well, I'm curious to what our listeners are thinking. Did anything really resonate with you? Please let us know what you thought about today's episode. Leave us a message at becomingelly.com or you can find us as Becoming Ellie on Facebook, Instagram, X, Pinterest, YouTube, and LinkedIn. We're always happy to hear from you. Also, if you like the podcast, please subscribe to it where you listen to us and maybe leave us a rating or a review. That would be great. Hey, it was wonderful talking with you today, Jill. I'm looking forward to our next episode of the Fit Strong Women Over 50 podcast. I am too. See you next time. Bye-bye. Bye. -bye. Bye.